Welcome to Finding Contentment, the official podcast of the American Institute of Stress. The goal of this podcast is to explore the science, psychology and practical wisdom that can help us manage our stress. If you are looking for personal growth and professional success, or just want a more fulfilling life, visit us at stress.org. And now here is the host and executive director of the American Institute of Stress, Will Heckman. Hey, greetings, everybody. This is your host and executive director for the American Institute of Stress. It's Will Heckman. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. Hope everybody is having a semi-stress-free day. And also, I'd like to ask you, if you're listening to this podcast today, go to stress.org. Make sure you subscribe to one of our magazines. We're going to be talking a little bit about veterans today. So why not subscribe to Combat Stress Magazine? It helps support veterans and first responders. And if you're watching us, you know I'm going to ask you to please hit the like button. Make sure to subscribe. I'm going to hit the little button thingy below. So now listen up. This is important. My guest doesn't even know I'm going to do this today. But that's the special gift for our listeners to today's show. We will be giving out a coupon code during the show that will give you 50% off membership to the American Institute of Stress. So get a pen ready. I'm going to get it to you. I'm going to put it down below. I'm also going to tell you what it is. All you have to do is go to stress.org and apply for membership, and you can use the coupon code when you complete your order, 50% off. As you know, this podcast is dedicated to exploring and promoting uh, uh, stress management, stress-related issues. Today, we're going to be discussing something important and a little serious, suicide prevention, and more specifically, the vital work of veteran crisis counselors. You know, the VA conducts the largest national analysis of veteran suicide rates each year, and findings are available, made available to the public in an annual report. And the report is based on national death certificate data currently available right now through 2021. And this report underscores the growing need for veteran-focused suicide prevention efforts. In 2021, more than 6,000, it was 6,392 veterans to be exact, died by their own hand, died by suicide. And that was 114 more than the previous year, which we dealt with COVID. Suicide, now listen to this, suicide remains the second leading cause of death for veterans under the age of 45. We can't let that happen. In today's episode, we're going to delve into the critical role that a veteran crisis counselors play in supporting those who have served our country and addressing the unique challenges they face and the impactful interventions they provide. We'll also discuss broader themes related to suicide prevention, and I hope together maybe we can break down some of the stigma surrounding mental health issues and 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 maybe foster a more compassionate environment where people feel safe and empowered to seek help. So joining us today is, is a friend of mine, and it's also someone who is uniquely qualified to speak about this important role, Brett Carter. Now, Brett is an author and Stress is Gone founder. He has over 20 years of experience in helping people release emotional pain. He facilitates groups Omega, Kripalo, uh, Tibet House, and the Himalayan Institute. Brett is AAETS certified. His methods is certified by the American Institute of Stress, one of the few that is. And he is IMMA accredited. He certifies suicide prevention specialists, meditation teachers, trauma recovery coaches. And Brett is also the ma meditation magazine trauma specialist. And we're proud to have him as a fellow of the American Institute of Stress. And because Brett is with us, here's that code I promised you. It is Brett Cotter 50. And if you use that code, Brett Cotter 50, I'm going to put it down below, you're going to get 50% off your membership. Just a little thank you to all of you who are listening and all the people that listen to Brett. Please join me in welcoming my buddy, Brett Cotter. Brett. Thanks for being here, man. I know you're busy as hell these days. 
Thanks so much for having me. It is so awesome to be with you again. And, uh, you know, we just got back from our women's retreat. Uh, we are busy, but, you know, anytime I have a chance to connect with you on this awesome podcast, you know, I jump on it. So thanks so much for having me. I We really appreciate all you do for us. By the way, everybody, if you're listening to this, Brett also got voluntold or I begged him. <laughs> and he's going to be doing a webinar for us on March 27th. Um, if you go on to stress.org and you go to the events tab, you can click on that and you'll find a way to register for that webinar. That's going to, that is going to be awesome. You get to listen to, to Brett instead of me. So, um, it's March 27, 3 PM Eastern time. He's going to cover a lot more than, um, well, of the kinds of things we're talking about today. Yeah, and Not I'm really excited about that, Will, because we're going to dive deep into the suicide prevention protocol and some of the Stress is Gone tool suite where we integrated um, a lot of the best practice crisis line approaches with our best practice mindfulness approaches to handle stress, anxiety, and trauma. So we're actually bringing that full circle into those crisis line calls. So That's I'm so awesome. excited to share that. You know, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you've done a lot of things. We have had discussions of all the different kinds of things you have done, including the retreats, which are just so astounding. But, you know, how did you get started in training the vet-to-vet -vet crisis counselors, the crisis line counselors? That seems a little, well, daunting. <laughs> it's, um, to date, I would say it's the most rewarding training experience I've had in my entire life. So this summer is going to be 25 years being involved in the trauma recovery space, right? So I'm really excited. That's going to be a, a good kind of like milestone for me. Yeah. 15 years ago, um, I met somebody that ran a suicide um, hotline and trained their counselors, right? And I pitched them the idea because I always wanted to write a script and have a flow chart and a protocol that kind of marries the mindfulness, the wellness and the stress is gone method in those phone calls to completely de-escalate de the caller on the other end. I didn't have any takers on that. So I just focused on the coaching program and the retreats, right? And um, writing my book. And that was what I've been doing for the last, you know, 15 years or so. Now, fast forward to last summer, the commissioner for the New York City Department of uh, Veteran Services invites my wife and I to table at City Field uh, at an amazing veterans event uh, full of incredible veteran service organizations from the tri-state area. And, you know, veterans were coming through uh, and meeting, you know, service organizations. And it was just an incredible day and a true honor to be invited there. So whenever I'm in that kind of space, I go around and meet the other vendors. So I'm walking around and connected with a bunch of them, truly amazing people. But one in particular started really asking me about my training background, because I also I have about 27 years total experience in training. Um, I was doing that before I got into the trauma recovery space and continued to. And then he was asking me about my suicide prevention background. And then he asked me a question that my like eyes lit up. He said, do you think you'd be able to design and deliver a training program that can help our six vet to vet crisis counselors learn mindfulness techniques to de-escalate the callers on the other end? And I was like, absolutely. So we had two Zoom meetings after that. Um, I asked them a bunch of questions about what their day-to-day -day is like, what they're responsible for, how they go through things now. And then I created something that just dovetailed nicely into their um, everyday work habits, as far as like the approach and, and the protocol and everything like that. And then we delivered the training in four double training sessions. And when we started, the six counselors um, rated their confidence level in handling suicidal ideation uh, in a crisis call from a zero to a two to a seven to an eight and a half in four double training sessions. So a wow. double training session is really you know, tripled money. it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a meaningful movement of the needle, right? Yeah. In any training program, going from a zero to a two, to a, 
you know, seven to an eight and a half. And um, the training was just, like I said, it was one of the most rewarding, if not the most rewarding training experience I've had in my entire life. Um, what an incredible yeah. opportunity. And they are so lucky to, to find you. <laughs> Think it was about like, it. The, the, the counselors, if, if you have any question that they were lucky, the counselors told you. I went from a two to like a seven or an eight in my confidence level. Yeah, and there was a few counselors even in there that because of that conversation, when it gets to the suicidal ideation, they even second guessed wanting to do the job regardless mm -hmm. because of because of the fear of that situation. So we created something that released all their fear and gave them the tools to handle the call. And um, it was it's just an amazing experience. And I feel so lucky that I actually met that organization that paid me to create the protocol because it was something that I always wanted to do. And it took a lot of time and research to find out the best practices of what those calls look like now and then identify the gap and then to kind of fit the stress has gone method right into it. So by the end of the call, the person on the other end is completely de-escalated. Right. And um, it's it's been an amazing, you know, journey since well, creating the protocol. What, 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 you know, talk about a trickle down effect from you to the counselor to the person on the other end of that phone who benefits from that training. I, I wanted to ask you, can you, explain to all of us um, suicide ideation, you, you know, and it's and how it progresses, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what brings people to that? I mean, you heard the statistic about yeah. veterans. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And I would say, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that most people have been affected by suicide. They either know somebody or had a friend who's relative or something or good. We, we've heard so many stories. What What is the progression? Great question. So for me, it all starts with unaddressed stress. And when we have a stressful situation, it could be like, a long-term relationship or a job situation <clears throat> or for veterans it's reintegrating into society and their families and their new apartment or their house right or coming back to their old house it's reintegrating you know how do you go through all that and then come back here so that reintegration period so that stress when it goes unaddressed right and they may be doing the best they can with it and finding ways to address it, but it's still there. The feeling's still there. So when that feeling lingers over time, it turns into anxiety. And when the anxiety is not properly addressed, that turns into overwhelm. Mm. And then that turns into hopelessness. And then that turns into depression. And when the depression um, is not addressed properly, then after a period that the brain determines is too long for sustained overwhelming pain, whether it's emotional pain, mental pain, physical pain, or spiritual pain, then a thing switches in the back of the brain that says, here's the way out. Mm -hmm. And that's where the suicidal ideation switch flips on. And that's just where you start thinking that suicide's an option and, and also planning, okay? So that's, to me, the cycle, how it grows, how it manifests, and the good news is there's many phases of that cycle. Wherever a person is, stress is gone, has tools to throw monkey wrenches into that whole entire cycle, even if you're at the tail end now with, you know, the suicide prevention uh, protocol. It's funny you said, I, cause I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is what, when, when you're talking to the counselors, um, what's the very first thing you tell them? I, you know, I, I can't even imagine attempting that job. But what is the first thing when you're when you're guiding them? What is it you speak about? So the first thing is, um, and it's one of my favorite parts about the training, is that they have to master the tools for stress, anxiety, and trauma recovery so that they can guide the folks through it on the other end of the call. So they actually work on their own stuff. And one of the most interesting dynamics that I witnessed in the training is when I'm teaching them how to release their own tension real time in the phone call. So typically in these phone calls, um, the counselor will be under stress 
because they're hearing something where they don't know if they're going to be able to fix it. And that makes any person nervous. No one on the planet is really meant to hear someone else say, I'm thinking of suicide, I'm thinking about ending it. And there's no reaction that that person on the other end of the phone has, right? So when we hear that, we automatically get flooded with stress. A lot of stressful thoughts fill our head. So what I teach is a simple technique where the counselors are de-stressing themselves real time as they're hearing what the other person's saying. So they have to be in tune with their body and they have to be in the moment to bring the caller from chaos to calm. So if the counselor is not calm inside in their core, it's gonna be almost impossible to bring someone to calmness. So the counselors really learn how to embody it so that naturally throughout the phone call, there's an equalize, an equilibrium that happens between the energy of the caller and the counselor. So it's really managing their own stress, no matter what they're hearing on the other end and releasing it real time so that they could reel the person in to that inner calmness that the counselor is in. Interesting. That's very interesting. I, I, because I, I don't know if I, if I could remain calm, you know, I'd be, I'd be pretty shaken up by that. None of us are meant to remain calm. That's what a robot would be. But what we do is we embrace the tension as it comes up in our body and we feel it. And then I give them um, a clarifying question. So when they hear like the red alert statement, they just say, please tell me more. And as they say that, they start breathing deep and slow into their own body and they're relaxing their body and releasing stress so they could come back to the present moment. You sent me a, a brochure that I've read, great brochure. Thank you. And uh, in it, you have something called the Crisis Counselor's Call Guide. Um, tell us about that. It, is that something, is it a script? Is it, I mean, you've seen it in action. You've, you, you've probably witnessed it being used. Tell us about that. Cause I'm reading about that. I, that really caught my interest. So it's a, a flow chart, right? So you have certain key areas of this call, right? You have the opening of the call. Then you have the body of the call where you're listening and you're empathizing and you're being sympathetic. Then you're also, at times you have to assess the risk if they're in risk of har harming themselves. Then you have the 911 dispatch protocol if they are in risk. And then you have this whole other area of clarifying questions and relaxation tools and then closing the call. So the first part of the um, protocol, you have the flow chart. So you can kind of see how the gears work together and as someone, as a counselor gets better and better and more familiar with the protocol, they are naturally shifting gears in between different aspects of the protocol, okay? And the beautiful part of it is if you get to the end and the person is not fully at peace, you just cycle through it again until they unlock and release all the tension in their body and the anxiety in their heart and their mind. Now, the script is underneath the flow chart. So the script is like you have the flow chart, the chunks of the conversation neatly laid out so you see how it interacts with each other and it flows together. But then in the next pages, you have the script, okay? And in our training sessions, it's live learning. So what we're doing is we're inter-team role-playing with the counselors, I'm listening, um, correcting and providing feedback real time. And then we have veterans call in. And that starts happening on the second day of training. So we are learning in live situations. Now, the veterans that are calling in, they work for the organization that I'm training the crisis counselors for. So they're not in the team, they do other things, but they are veterans, they have stress, and many of them call the crisis line, the larger crisis line for help, the national crisis line. Some even call it weekly and use it as therapy, mm. okay? So, what happens is they are hearing different degrees of risk, urgency, um, and different situations from veterans, and they're learning real time. And that's how they become more and more um, integrated with the protocol, and they learn how to shift gears because I'm helping them. Right. right. Sometimes I'm coaching them in the call. Sometimes we wait till the call is done. 
And then I ask them, what do you think you did good? What do you think you need to work on? And then we kind of bring it all around. So the training is a lot of live learning. And then we go in and discuss what happened in all those calls. What should the, the account, now you, you mentioned this a couple of times, they're hearing this, they're, they're listening to this. What specifically are they listening for? Are they listening for certain, certain terms? Are they listening for a tone? That, what are they listening for? This is, you know, you're, you're not, we're not dealing with cars. Right. You know, we're not dealing with you. You can replace a part. Hey, I'm listening for a knock in the engine. We're talking to a human being who they're all different. What, what do you tell them to listen for specifically? A lot of it is tone. So the erraticness in the voice, if they're, if the person's completely irrational and going through like the dark night of the soul right there. And they're yeah. very, um, their stress is really super high or if they're completely disengaged from the conversation and feel very distant and there's long pauses, right? So that's where you want to throw in, Hey, um, mm. by any chance, have you thought about hurting yourself for anyone today? Do you think you're in risk of hurting yourself? Um, have you made any plans? So there's certain questions that are in the protocol that if you do get a yes, you're dispatching and looping in um, 911. And the major part of the phone of the flow chart and the phone call is keeping someone on the line until help arrives. And that's really the scariest um, part for a suicide prevention counselor, crisis counselor, right? But we have like 20 statements that they read through, the counselors read through, and they circle their favorite ones. So now they have tools and things to say to bring them back into the moment, to buy 30 seconds, to buy two minutes, um, to buy five minutes until help arrives. So it's really, that I feel is the gold nuggets. There's a lot of gold in the protocol, but I feel like when a crisis counselor feels confident, and that's again, going back to the you know, the zero to two rating to, to the seven to eight and a half in confidence. It's really those tools in knowing what to say. Um, that's really what I feel is uh, so life-saving. You know, there, there's two components I feel to the life-saving uh, aspect of this protocol. One is how empathetic and sympathetic the counselor becomes and how they get the person to open up. We came up with 10 statements that help the counselor, almost like a little soft ratchet that helps untighten the, the nuts and the bolts and the screws so that the person can just express how they're feeling. And it provides a safe space that they are able to let out all the things that they've never told anybody in that phone call. And that to me is the divine service of this protocol. And it shows in the feedback that I'm getting from um the upper management folks and from the counselors that are fielding these calls from the folks that I've trained. Um, the emails that come in are just really inspire me to keep on wanting to do this and, and to focus on it. You know, I focus yeah. on the coaching and the retreats, but really I want to make sure that there's always a pipeline of crisis counselor teams that I'm training, you know, and this I, training is always happening. I love the, the, the way you put it using a ratchet to loosen those bolts a little because you know if a guy or a woman is calling they're going to be wound pretty tight you know it they're 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 wound up there's something so loosening that that's a great way to put that I, I just as a matter of curiosity my own curiosity when it gets to the point where you feel someone is going to hurt themselves and you do loop in first responders who goes so being a former on, being a former cop, mm -hmm. I wasn't trained in it. It depends on what the situation is. If there's a weapon involved, if they are in danger of harming others, right? So it's either going to be EMS or the police. Okay, right. That's who. That's and then the nine one one dispatch. They determine who that's going to be. And I'm assuming at that point it's the Baker Act. You know, they just come in to protect that person okay. or another party. So. It, what, what about people who are not trained? You know, if you're speaking to someone that is showing suicide ideation, um, but I haven't been trained, 
what to do? What are some of the little things that they can do to make them maybe reconsider? So I feel it goes back to... And I realize, Brett, that's not an easy question, that you're not going to be able to train me in two seconds. Mm -hmm. But just just it's the to, approach. to loosen that bolt a little. It's the approach, and it's the um, mindset of getting right into it with the person so they don't feel alone. And I think the most important thing, if you are um, with someone that's suffering with suicidal ideation, that you're looping in help, right? You're calling the uh, 988 number and they're getting the professional help and the services they need. But also in the moment, it's tell me more. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I want to hear everything. These are some statements that um, allows the person to open up those plumes of pain that have been locked inside. And that's exactly what this protocol does. It's knowing what to say to get them to feel more safe so they could let the next layer out. And what I found is as the person expresses the layers of pain, each time another layer comes up, right? And especially when you get to that core layer and they feel safe enough to say it to you, that's when you're about a minute or two out from clarity. Yeah. It's facing the darkest thoughts and feelings and them knowing someone's in it with them. And then if it is someone that's in your personal life, creating a support network for them and that person knowing that you are the first person right there and that they are your number one priority. It's sort of like so a little not pressure alone. release valve. As, that's you, that's as that's they it. talk to you, that let off a little bit of steam and maybe the next step is talking to somebody like you or somebody you've trained. It's so it's providing a safe space and not um, like advising, giving your critique, telling them what you think they should do about the problems. Mm -hmm. It's just tell me more. I want to hear everything. All right. I'm not going anywhere. These are the statements that you cycle through and always come back to until they've said everything. And I call this emptying the tank. So they have a tank of emotional pain and a tank of mental anguish. And all you want them to do is to express it to you so that they let it out. And it's almost like a volcano finally erupting. But when it all comes through the mouth, it doesn't blow out the side of the mountain. Yeah. And if you think about... Yeah. Um, Veterans, when they're going to talk to professionals that have no idea what the veteran went through, that might not understand the acronyms the veterans are using, um, that they just have a look in their face towards the veteran. And then the veteran now has a lot of stuff brought up and then the session's over and now they have to go deal with it. Um, that's part of the problem. Uh, there's many other components to the problem, um, but that is a part of the problem. And this just allows the counselor to get into the lowest component. I talk about it almost being in like the sewer. You're getting into the sewer right. of the consciousness with the person and you're letting them know that it's safe to be there because you're with them. You are a calm sounding board. And then as they express all the pain, now you're bringing them up to the curb. And then when they come into the office, you're bringing them on the sidewalk. And then when you get them reintegrated into the community and volunteering with some things that they're passionate about, now you got some wheels in the car. And now they start to touch base with a sense of purpose again. And now they're back in the flow of life. Yeah. So the crisis lines that I um, train, they're local crisis lines, which means local callers are calling them. So these crisis line counselors, they're able to deliver the statement, this is not a one-time call, we're in it for the long haul. I wanna meet you tomorrow at 10 a.m. I believe in you and I'm I'm submitting a request right now to be your case manager. And then you start linking them in and locking them into the proper services. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I, but it brings up another question, dude. What about the counselors? You know, right. I, I'm, I'm imagining a lot of these counselors are former vets themselves. Yep. It's my, it's my imagination, you know, but, but that's what I imagine. And it, it's my field is stress. 
I have to imagine that this is a very stressful thing to do. Somebody's life may be in your hands. What do you tell them about maintaining their own mental health and, you know, and, and their own well-being? So in all our retreats and all my coaching and in this training, I tell them that they, the individual, has to be their number one priority, right? So anyone that I train in this protocol, they have um, access to our membership. So myself and my wife, we teach six classes a week. It's 20 to 25 minutes a day. And we are helping people ground in their own self-confidence, their own ability to release stress. And we're teaching them how to do it on their own. So when they're in the membership, they are really integrating the stress is gone method and really a new lifestyle and how they approach stress. And remember, in these calls, the first thing we're training them how to do is how to release their own stress in the middle of the phone call. So by the time they are done and they've completely de-escalated the caller, they are also in a relaxed state. Okay. And the fulfillment of bringing somebody that called the crisis line, now they're scheduled to come into the office the next day, right? It's um, it's an amazing feeling. They you know, kind of take a journey with them. To, Absolutely. To, to releasing that stress. I get that. I, I you know, I do. I, I mean... I could, I, and again, it's just a supposing my imagination, little gray matter left in my brain is, is that as a, the counselor brings that person out of that darkness, you first start out, it's a journey from down deep in that mud up to a level of normalcy that once they take that journey together, the counselor would feel better. I still think it's, um, these people are amazing. The counselors um, certainly have my admiration. I mean, it's a hard job. And it's a super lives. hard job. It's they're a saving. super, super hard job. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of burnout in it. Um, right. There's not enough people in, you know, the field. Um, and it's... Understandably. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, a, you want to volunteer at a dog shelter. That's one thing. You want to volunteer doing this. You got to be, you got to be tough. You got to be able to do that. And Thank God they I, got guys like you to, to give them a way, you know, a, 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 that script, that flow chart. For those of you that don't know, a flow chart is, is kind of like a map. If this mm -hmm. happens, then go here. If this happens, then go there. Um, it's an old computer term, but it's, it's a great tool. Uh, and Brett is using it a, in a great way. Uh, I did want to ask you, you know, for those people listening who are not vets, who are dealing with a lot of stress, um, what if they're, if they're having a crisis and thoughts of suicide, and and what can they do? What could, what should what should they do? Um reach out, right? So you, if you're going through the toughest time of your life, there's three areas of your support network. There's your family, okay? Have your support network on speed dial, have it on your fridge, write the names, phone numbers out. So you have your family, you have your friends, and then you have your healthcare professionals, right? Okay. Um, so you have that. And then there's got to be something that you're integrating into your every single day to get you to get the wheels back on the car, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just remembering to a time that I was super depressed, right? When I was in family court many years ago, um, and I started losing the case and went through a relationship breakup at the same exact time. There was a moment where I actually wanted to die, right? And the one thing that helped me get through was just allowing myself to cry. That's when stressed upper breath work came through, thank God in that moment, which was, I heard a little voice in the back of my mind saying, I'm okay. You know what? It was like one per, once per minute, I would hear that in the midst of crying. And then it was, I was getting to the gym from 5.45 to 6.30 um, or so. And was just that I felt the endorphins kick in when I was there. Now, when I got home, it would come back in. And then I got the help that I needed and with, with a therapist, right? So I feel like it's important to understand that the answers aren't going to come from just sulking, sitting in the bed or on the couch. Um, 
and doing the same old thing. You got to reach out and do something a little bit different, but really it's the human connection and people care about you. People love you. Um, and then it's understanding that cycle that it's normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. The thoughts, even I, I had a vision of seeing my wristlet in a tub. And I was like, mm -hmm. when I had that vision, I was like, Oh my God, it feels so peaceful. And then I was like, wow, I'm messed up that I, that, that felt peaceful. I was like, Holy cow, big light bulb went off. And that's when I was like, now I need to make a change. I knew that. Right. So if that's happening with you, it's okay. All right. It's yeah. okay. It's time to make the change now. And it's the support network. It's changing your daily routine. Okay. The the first day is the toughest because you might be going to bed real late and getting up real late. And that's just the thing that messes up your whole circadian rhythms. Right. So you, the first day is the hardest. You got to get your butt up at like five 30 to start your day. The reason is you'll end up going to sleep earlier that night because you only got a few hours sleep. And then plus, if you bring the activity into the day early on, and then you have your support network that you're reaching out to. Um, so those I think are really important if you're going through it. And then remember, it's just part of a cycle. There was a stress that went unaddressed that turned into anxiety, which turned into overwhelm, which turned into hopelessness, which turned into depression. And then that your brain decided that the depression and the pain went on too long. And your brain was like, mm -hmm. here's the way out. Good it's a it. normal thing. It's like a logical thing in our subconscious that this happens. Okay. And, um, you know, just like at some points we have like the the final moment uh, statements in the protocol. And when people start to hear the final wave of negative thoughts, which is my life was a complete waste. Everyone else is better off without me, right? When we hear that with the protocol, right? We just say, okay, we're going to call your mother right now. We're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to loop her in and just see if it's true. We just yeah. see if it's true. Okay. So what I want you to know is that when you have that, you know, my life was a complete waste. Um, and, um, everyone else is better off without me. That's a, called the final wave of negative thoughts that come right before your brain's going to want to go to the final stage. Okay. So that's when you need to get to help right now. And that's when you have to call 988. Okay. And that's when you have to dive in with your support system. So and 988 is the, the national suicide prevention line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and I understand that if you feel like your family and friends and the healthcare professionals might not be giving you exactly what you need, but it's, you just have to reach out. Okay. And something new is going to happen. And I encourage you to go to stressisgone.com um, to check out what we have and how we approach it as well. Okay, because it is a normal component of the human experience. Okay, and I understand the feelings are the darkest, most painful things in the world, but I want you to remember this. It's temporary. And I know you think it feels like it's permanent. It is only temporary. And the more the counselors and the people help you breathe into the pain and we help you express it all that's when it starts to unlock from your body and release from your consciousness you know someone else is there I with heard, you. sorry didn't mean to interrupt you <laughs> i heard it it's a psychologist once tell me that uh, suicide is a comforting thought it's it's like okay the pain can't end it's that's why it's normal you know but just like you didn't know this bad thing was going to happen before it did you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It may bring something good too. Right. And it's a process of letting go of the pain and then reintegrating with society, reigniting a new purpose. Right. And that's such a big component with um, the veteran suicide rate where they feel disconnected from their purpose because they were trained to do something. They were programmed and trained to do something. They went out and did it. Many of them have... Um, moral injury because the reason why they went in to the military was to fight off the bad guy and protect their family and their country. And in that experience, a lot of folks feel like what they were told to do was not that. And it was in misalignment with their own inner purpose and desire mm -hmm. to serve. Okay. So then they come back with that moral injury right. and that weighs so heavy on the consciousness of any human being 
So it's part of reintegrating with a new purpose that you feel awesome about. And that's waiting just around the corner. Lives change just like that. A lot of times it's the one, two, or three proper services in place, whether the service is a marriage counselor, whether it's um, finances, because you feel like you're losing your home or you can't pay your rent, um, whether it's a job counselor. It's, it's once the, those two or three services get put into place, that's just like putting the wheels back on the car. Now you could get back into society, in your community, and show up for yourself and your family. Um, that's when everything changes. You know, and that's the part of the work that I love seeing and witnessing. And I like that you said, you know, put a list on your refrigerator. Do this, then do this, and then, you know, mm -hmm. do this. But, you know, at AIS, and I've said this a lot of times, there's a lot of different things you can do. There's one thing you should never do, and that's nothing. So right. if you do nothing, nothing's going to change. And, and we've all been there. You know, if you, if like Brett just said, you can get yourself back on the track. If you're feeling, you know, that, that darkness surrounding you, that, that dark cloud following you, you know, move, get, get out from underneath it. But you're the one that's going to have to move. Right. And just, it, 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 it's funny, but as soon as you start to do something, you will feel better. Everything starts to change. You you will you will feel more in control, and you will feel better. Okay, I'm on my way to feeling better because I took that very first step. But that was you know all the things you have said. I can't wait for the webinar. Me too. Because, I'm really excited. You know because it's I we can't talk about as much as I want to and like I get excited. I interrupt you and like you know it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I want I want to ask so many questions, but we can't do it in this in this amount of time because it's it's such an important topic it is it, the the statistic that i said at the beginning of this show that it's the number two killer for veterans under the age of 45 is it just blew me away to read that it hurt me to actually read that we asked these young men and women to do to serve our country and to protect us and to god knows this is a dangerous world how can we we can't let this happen we're and lucky to have people like you, Brett. Thank you, Will. And I would say that I'm so lucky to partner with some of the veteran service organizations that I have. Um, I've learned from working with a partner of mine, Michelle Ladd. She runs National Veterans Resources. She takes an RV throughout the country with her husband, Randy. That's a mission, you know, 22 to zero. And it's like stop veteran suicide. And so when she pulls over, veterans come into her um, RV and they share their story. Often it's stuff that they've never told anybody. And whenever she has met someone over the years, that's like right on the fence. She, I say, give them my phone number. Then I usually do a few sessions with them and then they're back on their way on the phone. Right. So I learned through partnering with her from repping it out, from dealing with veterans in that situation. And then I've also learned a lot from this new group that Michelle started. It's called Mothers of Veteran Suicide. And these are the moms that have lost their, their sons and daughters to suicide that are, you know, that are veterans. And some of the things that I want folks to really be aware of is there are some, uh, some things that go on in a veteran's life that are very telling and are like, really should be aware for the family and the veteran. So medication changes. You don't hear a lot about this in the news, but medication changes often happen between three weeks and three months before a suicide, okay? Mm -hmm. If the veteran is in family court and they don't have access that they're happy with to their children, or if there is a, um, a very um, volatile relationship with their spouse or their partner, that is also a very big trigger to these types of events. Um, if there's an STD diagnosed or any sexual dysfunction. And um, so those are really important things just to be aware of that if that is in the veteran in your life, in going on in their lives, it's something to be extra aware of and to stay extra in tune. And a lot of times it's the veteran that was checking in on other people. The one that was like helping their friends out. There are other veterans that are going through tough times, right? It's not 
it's not always the person that you think is the picture of depression and of that, right? That's, um, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's when medication changes, like when, when that happens, a lot of times uh, our veterans are on one, two, and three medications. So in the moments when you're changing medications, that is a very vulnerable period. Um, if there is a custody battle going on or they don't have access to their kids or there is a very um, tense relationship with their spouse or partner, these are all very big, important triggers to be aware of. Especially and the mo and most on. important thing is be aware. Be aware. Right. You know. Right. Uh, hey, don't forget Rhett Cotter 50 for a 50% off the membership to stress.org, which is another great place to find out a lot of information about, you know, stress management to keep you from getting to the point of anxiety and depression. Um, lastly, Brett, got to ask you, buddy, ask everybody, what are you doing lately to manage your stress? What tool do you use? What is, when, when Brett is feeling like, oh my God, today was like, you know, a real show. What do you do? So great question. You know, in my 25 years experience in this field, it's been an evolution, right? Before I got into the field, it was going to the bar, uh, getting into arguments. That's how, I, <laughs> that's how I dealt with my stress. Then it went from, then went to meditating. Um, sometimes it's a jog, sometimes it's a dirt bike ride in the mountain. But where it's come to is this technique that came out of a retreat we did a few months back, and it's called the Four Steps to Freedom. So this is where I'm at with this now. It's whenever I'm super stressed out, no matter what the situation is, I'll touch the tension, start breathing into the tension. So I see, I feel the airflow moving through it. And then I express all my feelings with no sense or judgment. And if my trigger is in front of me, I do a little break, I walk away and I express everything. And then right when I've emptied the tank, when I've said everything I need to say, when all, whatever preformed emotions came out of me, um, then I just command, which is a simple statement. I unlock and release all of the, whatever it was, anger or sadness and that part of the body. So if, for me, it's like usually stress has to do with anger and my heart. So I'll say, I unlock and release all the anger in my heart right now. Thank you. And then I'm good to go. So it's touch, breathe, express. And then I say that command. And that's the four steps to freedom. And I just do that every time. And if you even want to get it down even more concise to that, I just say how I feel. In the moment, I'll break the situation if there's a trigger in front of me, and I'll just express how I feel. And from expressing how I feel, I feel free again with usually within one to five minutes. It's a great answer, man. Hey, if if, if you want, rewind, listen to that again. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, there, it's the, he's doing something about his stress, and so should you. Brett, I want to thank you so much for coming on and 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 doing all the things that you do there is no thank you that's big enough to to tell you for helping all the crisis counselors and all the people that you've helped you you know that buddy and I, we really appreciate it we appreciate all you do for AIS too thank you will just one final word i just am so honored with the coupon code which is what was it again it's Brett Cotter. You can uh, remember that. Brett Cotter, 50. You can get 50% off any level of membership that you are uh, applying for. And this is a funny story. Over the years when I'm like doing research on stats and I'm looking stuff up from writing an article and stuff, it always goes back to AIS because whenever I find the interesting stuff, I'm like, oh, what side am I on? I'm on AIS. So AIS is, I feel, a treasure trove of knowledge, tools, and techniques, and just an amazing place to get the true goods, you know, from stress is gone. So I am, I mean, the true goods of awareness and, and stress management techniques. So I'm really honored to be a member and to have our stressed up for breath work and our core methodology certified. And um, I'm always honored to hang with you, Will. I love spending time with you, consider you a good friend. And uh, it's it's been great. And I'm so excited about the webinar, because we're going to do a deep dive into the technique, into the suicide prevention protocol. And I encourage all the members who have a passion for suicide prevention and all the mental health professionals that are out there that maybe want to pick up one or two different tools or, or sayings or phrases, come to the webinar. It's going to be awesome. It is. And, and I'm looking forward to it too. And by the way, AIS, the reason we are 
a, 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 the international entity that we are is because we have members like you. It's true. But it's not, not because of me. Let's let's be honest. Like, you know, it's because of people like Dr. Dan Kirsch and the other people that, that are involved with it and have been involved with it. And, and Paul Roche and Hunt say, hey, who's why we exist? He's the guy who started us and guys like you. So thank you. And thank you, everybody else, for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate you doing. Don't forget that Brett Carter 50 coupon doesn't last forever. So as a 30 day expiration date on it. So make sure you do it. This has been your host, Will Heckman. I want to thank you all for joining us. Don't forget to please follow, subscribe to this podcast. Join us at stress.org. And like I said before, I want to remind everyone just as stress is different for each of us. There's no one stress reduction or management strategy that is right for everyone. So that means you got to join us next time because we're going to explore more stress management strategies and insights, and maybe you'll pick up a tool or two. And I want to, th I hope that everything that Brett and I have said today will help you find contentment. It's a good day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody.